She's so cool. She allows us to bring a sheet the day of the exam. But this is where I trick them. This is so cool. So every student is expected to bring one. Everybody is required to bring one. And I'm going to tell you why I make it like that. So they work as a cohort in the academic support center, and they bring me these cheat sheets right before the exam. And these are some of the pictures of some of the stuff we've gotten from actual students. Because it's not enough for me to tell you. I want to show you. Look at this stuff. So they're allowed to put whatever they want, one side, and I want them to handwrite it. And I advise them to use a color block. Do, do you see the significance behind this? So what a lot of them do is they'll go, okay, chapter one, purple. Chapter two, green. Chapter three, and they remember it as they wrote it, and they'll remember it as they highlighted it. Certain parts of, of your brain tends to remember how you process stuff on paper, and you tend to recall the information much better. So everybody brings me a cheat sheet. No cheat sheet is obsolete. And the reason I'm saying that is we get this example from somebody, this is somebody else, and then I put this one in. Because for this person, that was a cheat sheet. And what he did was he did a schematogram with you know various bubbles. He was an audio, he was a visual learner. And that's how he processed the information. For this girl, she was more of an order person. So this is how she processed the information. So this is how we do it. We we let them come in and they kind of show off. Look what I did, look what I did. Now you may not be able to see this on the I did. But there was something on here with the, the balance and coordination. Something yes. split in one of the brain regions that they had to go. So, one of the students was a med fan. So what did they do? They wrote the word med, and they do a baseball in the back, and they actually drew the arrows, kind of faded out, can't see it here. But the arrows in the back hitting the ball, they knew that that was eye and hand coordination. That was the type of metacognition that they were actually coming up with on their own to help them to process that information. Mm -hmm. So after they come in with these review sheets, then we've been moving them. This is what I can do, because I can do that. What I do is, so they go to the ASC, with the review sheet, they prepare their cheat sheet, and they come back to the class. They sit in a group, and I make them work as a committee. They sit together as a group to take the exam, and everybody whips out their little sheet, and they as a group have to decide which one they're gonna be allowed to use during the exam. So out of four people, they're only, only allowed to use one of the cheat sheets. So what they do is, as a committee, they sit together, and they truly were like, Yours is better. I think we have a better chance with this one because I allow them to use one during the exam. The reason I make everybody do it is because if you don't make everybody do it, there'll be the people that are in a group and they'll let one person in the group do all the work and they'll just sit there and smile. Yeah. So I don't do that. I make sure that everybody participates. So they're in the groups, they select one, they collaborate, and they finish the exam. Now, if you notice the question that I handed out, this is the kind of questions that I get. I don't give multiple choice. I think it dumbs people down. I think we have this hand holding in society and if we don't stop and realize that people are capable to make their own decisions and critical think through analysis and do analysis, we're gonna be raising a bunch of idiots. Like we need to really be careful about the way we write questions and exams and things like that. Yeah. One question. What happens when you put them in groups and I see that let's say you have a bunch of people that write a lot of words and then you have a person that uses pictures and that person would really rather use their pictures, but then the group chooses the one that's inconsistent with their style. We've had, I've had that happen before, and then what I do is I'll ask the person, you know, once they have the, the group, I call it the group meeting, mm -hmm. and I give them a sheet, an evaluatory, you know, like an evaluation sheet, and I say, which one are you using and why? Do you still want to participate in the group? It's kind of anonymous, and I, I get to see it. So if I see a person that doesn't want to work with the group, but they still want to use their paper, I let them to their own discretion. Okay. Because I can't force that person to be so a lawyer. So they're the way that the, the others are. Right. right. But what's interesting about that, and I'm glad you said that, is so I give them this question. Explain how dopamine receptors contribute to a booking time. And what happens is they begin to work together. And they'll say, Amber, how does it work? And Amber will say, she may not have her page in front of her, but she'll say, but I remember how I wrote that. That was on chapter one. That was da 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 da, -da. So, Automatically, they're recalling the information, and because they're working in a group and everybody's accountable, you kind of take this nerve away. And so they work on the problem, and they actually understand it as a critical thinking process, rather than just let me nail you. This is an exam, and I'm here to nail you. you know? So it's very interesting. We've actually thought about separating people according to learning styles and putting groups according to learning styles, but then 
like one of our argumentative proses is, well, the real world is not like that, right? You get people from all different kinds of walks. So we just let people work to their own discretion. And that's the way I've kind of dissipated that, just by giving them like this form of kind of saying, do you still want to participate in the group or do you, do you rather work by yourself? That's fine. Well, yeah. also, also, you're, you're strictly um, getting them to met, use of metacognition, practice, recall. Mm -hmm. That's really what this is about. The learning style relative to that is not so important. Mm -hmm. I mean, it might be in the exam when it comes to time, like, well, they yeah. want to recall information that they, the, that they have already processed on their own. But in terms of the process of the groups, you know, it's, it's, all, it's not about that. It's a sneaky way of getting them to practice and think about it, as yeah. opposed to, it means so much as you know practice besides multiple choice exams is this notion that you're doing it all on your own and you're going to bring all your like it's like you're the solitary backpack you're going to bring your stuff to yeah. the exam it's all going to be in here yeah. and as a, but this is a way of getting them to practice and it's a learning practice yeah and, and, and I, yeah. Think, I think also it's uh i, I like that you uh, have them you know have that diversity within the, the people that in the way that they learn mm -hmm. because uh, like you said there's the real world, it means that it's diverse. And also because we're not just uh, thinking about the way that they learn, but the way that they debate that what they learn with other people that have different right. learning styles. Because something that I see happen a lot, uh, and it, it happens within, within work, it's that some people think of it a certain way, and then when they try to express it, they don't know how. They don't know how. And they know their stuff, but that is, so one thing is learning, another thing is communication, and I think that gets people, you know, it's, it's a better exercise. Oh, I, I really like right, so we're actually showing them communication skills, and we're actually showing them real world skills, yeah. and we're taking away this whole nerve of, I can't study, I can't do it, it's an exam, versus we're all in the group, let's discuss the questions, and I urge them to discuss it, and I actually give them, so I give them 30 minutes to kind of discuss the paper they're going to use, why, kind of get to know each other, and it's really interesting because I noticed that, you know, back in the day I used to have this curve that you talked about, but with this, it, everybody does it so well, and it's because the team captain will be in charge, and they'll be like, did you do your part? Remember, do you remember? You know, and they kind of force each other, they, know they reinforce each other, and it's great. It's really nice when it works out. There have been some catastrophes, but I would say the catastrophes are under 5%. I, this is overwhelmingly, this has overwhelmingly done great in my classes. Um, so then they finished the exam. They finished the exam. And then what I did was, I, I did a survey. I did a survey of, of my students. I asked them the questions. I'm like, I'm like, dudes, how do you, um, what do you feel about the exam? I gave them a survey, a survey monkey. Taking a group exam made me feel, so I said nervous, less nervous, not nervous at all, to see what I was gonna get, and the answer is overwhelming. It's an, it, very interesting. Almost all of them said it made me feel less nervous. So the increase in their grades, comparing to what people used to get before when I wasn't doing this practice, is amazing, amazing. And then another question I asked them, I said, preparing the cheat sheet, allowed me to remember how much of the material. And I look at the, the answer was, I love that. It was up to 90% of the material. 50% uh, or fewer than 50. So it, to me, it was very interesting to see that at least they were kind of retaining it, or the ones that took the survey. They were kind of getting the information for themselves. So I had them write an analysis when we were done with the class, and I had them write an analysis about this actual procedure, and I just wanted to get their testimonials so excuse the grammar, these are actual students writing stuff. Um, one of them wrote, and I like the first one because not everything is a peaches and cream story, right? You're always gonna have your ones that are skeptical. And this guy wrote, I was a bit skeptical at first. I never experienced this method before. I learned that this way was a great way to notice how different types of individuals can come together and work well as a whole. It was great experience. I would recommend you, Dr. Barral, in a heartbeat with my eyes closed. I say for some <laughs> But that's exactly what I wanted to see. I wanted them to see that you can work in a group, you can have a different style, but it doesn't mean that you can't work together effectively and get a, get the task done. Um, I think working in a group based exam was terrific because instead of getting nervous and stressing right before the exam, it made me feel secure that I have four other brains working with mine to accomplish an exam together. Um, each group members brought a little piece of what they absorbed, of what they absorbed the most 
uh, to the group, we were able to work the answers out together and learn from each other. And that was the whole practice of this, that I wanted people, no, it's, it, for me, it's meaningless, it's mindless to give somebody an exam, make them memorize all this information, and make them memorize top 10% of whatever they learn, and then they leave, the, they leave the exam, and you don't remember nothing. I mean, great. I still have kids who stop me in the hallway, and they're like, cocaine receptors. I'm like, <laughs> you know, depending on who's behind me, like, they probably think I'm getting them coke in class. I'm not, but <laughs> they understand the process, and they understand the real transmission, and, and these, for these type of students, these are difficult terms. So for them to speak in this way and kind of refer to themselves in a manner that's scientifically and academically sound and correct, for me, we did our job. Like, this is what we wanted to get accomplished. Mm -hmm. So, with that said, um, Amber? So there were just some other student benefits that we saw to this. So obviously there was an increase in comprehension. We saw from the data that there was students who did retain more information they became an active learner. They were actively involved in the learning process. <laughs> I didn't do the same thing as your presentation. <laughs> I didn't do that. <laughs> and ownership for learning. And I think that that's one of the most valuable points that stood out here as one of the great benefits. Because they were taking ownership for their learning. They were holding everybody accountable. Mm -hmm. It was actually pretty cute because um, we were assisting the students with making their cheat sheets. And so what I would do is before her, the day of her exam, before she got to campus, I would run to her classroom just to make sure everybody had a cheat sheet and everything was okay. And you already started seeing the students actually working together. They were forming their groups and they were sitting down and reviewing the information. So as an educator, I was like, oh, for that moment. There were benefits for it as a professor too because then you were able to act more as a, as a facilitator. We moved away from being in that role of, it's my job just to give you all of this information. We were actually Revisiting the information that you can pack lean and help you to put those connections together. Um, it was also a great opportunity to provide clarification because you were doing those little checks for understanding through this process to actually understand what your students did understand versus what they did not understand. There was any misconceptions. What else did you need to review during that time as well? Yeah. Did you have a, a, a feature in that process where while during the group work, not during the exam itself, but beforehand that they could ask you if they needed clarification on something? Yes, yes. Okay. So when they were, yes, so they would come to my department first okay. to make their cheat sheet. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so right. she and I would have that, that level of communication, uh, and then I would also encourage the students, because my department has all these computer labs, so she was getting an influx of emails if needed be. But she also visited my department too. So sometimes she would just pop in and go, oh, you know, we were looking at, can you explain? And she was able to do so there. And at the start of class, those questions came up. I'll give you a great story. I had one of the groups, they were fabulous. Mm -hmm. These four kids, they sat together. I mean, all of them were fabulous, really, but they were really communicative and they really enjoyed each other's presence. Like, they became a family after my class because I had I gave them two exams and they had to do a, an intervention. If you want to find out more, you got to come to my class. So I'm not giving you a little freebie. <laughs> but the one girl in the class, she got hired by the college. She got hired by the college to run the um, medical assisting. She was some kind of administrator, and she needed she needed a person to help her. She was hiring an assistant. She wanted an assistant that was a student as a federal work study. She needed an assistant, and she needed some references as to who could work together with other people, who was good in a group, and she remembered the girl from the class, and she ended up emailing me and was like, do you have Daddy's email? Because there's a job here, and I know that she was looking for work, and she worked really nice with me in this group, and I want to hook her up. And now they're working and they're each, she's the girl's mentor and they work together in the school. And it's just a simple thing that you would never think people would make a connection from working together. Something so simple like this can create such a great learning opportunity and this kind of learning cohesiveness between people. And I think that was it. Thank you. 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 Yeah, so don't worry about it, we're good. Um, yeah, so we just, we explored these, um, this methodology, we think it's cool. Um, the problem is that, you know, with most schools, professors, are, and I hate to say it, they're complacent. They do the same thing over and over, they don't wanna try new things, and that's a problem, because that's not reaching the millennial students, and that's not, you're not up to date, you know, with the technology and the resources that you have available. So you should see how I amp up the um, 
the actual learning process and I make technology a part of the learning process and you know gets it gets the students in gear and it helps them do bigger better things you want them to do bigger and better than you I mean that's the whole point of everything yeah do you think that maybe there's a need to do the same thing that you're doing right now for preparing them for the tools that the new the new tools that they could be using for for the students like you said that they don't want to learn something Oh, for faculty, absolutely. Faculty. So absolutely. I, I think this is great because they learn. They didn't. The professors didn't learn the same way that you right. teach them right now. Right. So by experimenting, by experiencing this, then they able to do like is is that's the way that we learn and that we change social behavior is by them participating right. and then they'd be like, "My experience was amazing. I want to teach. I want to do this by for example. my students." So, absolutely. Madam, I don't know if you're uh, already planning on doing something we're, we're like on that it. in college. We're on it, and we've done it before. So we had, you know, a friend of mine, he, he adopted it, and he did it in his class. How does it like? He loves it. He doesn't know how to test any other way now. I mean, I mean, but, so the, uh, he's using it to teach? He's using it to teach his psychology. So he does applied psychology, and he does abnormal psychology. Now he's doing that type of testing. He's like, oh my God, it takes me two days to grade all the exams because we have to read, it's like many essays. But he, he, he loves it because with the multiple choice, he was getting such a bad distribution. And he would get like 20 people in the class, 18 are failing. Like, and he's like, I don't know if it's, I'm not making a connection. I don't know what the deal is. He came to one of our workshops and he adopted the methodology. And I think he has the numbers for me as well. Ridiculous. The amount of you know how well and how better prepared the students were, and then the other aspect we could share with you earlier was sometimes was the, one of the first times we did this workshop. We had a room full of students, and the professor was actually in the room. And when the professor saw that the students were like, "Oh yes, yeah, this is something we would like to try," that was another way that we were able to get some of the other faculty. And they were all French. They didn't know one bit of English. Mm -hmm. So when she started in. lecturing on this stuff, they were like, <laughs> "Yeah." So, but they got the message, and it was it was enough to say that they understood what I was trying to do. So, and that's the thing. It's kind of like learn by immersion, right? Yeah. <laughs> but you can't think that everybody's you know learning or everybody yeah. knows what you do. It's different. Everybody's different. I, I, I find it fascinating because I'm, I'm in communications, and you at the end you're trying to uh, teach people a certain message, right? So I think it's amazing. And something that uh, just occurred to me was that. Uh, I have a friend that his, his kid is autistic. Wow. And him and his wife, they're amazing teachers. Like, they figure out the best possible way to they teach can. them. So I think all of us have some type of, uh, like, like that, that, you know, some level of, of, uh, of looking for ways to learn, to better learn. So I think this is kind of like the same spectrum, but they are, you know, with autism, it's a bit more, it's, it's more complicated. Right. So, I, you know, I find it fascinating how you can develop those type of teaching methods to improve something like that. I don't even know if they're using the, if teachers for special ed are using some methods like this in order to, because I know I've seen complications with different teachers yeah. Yeah. With, for special ed that they try something that is maybe by the textbook and then they just say, I, I don't know, you know, the, the kid's not paying attention. But then the kid is approached by another one, another professor that, that really knows it, and he caught the learning style of, of, of the child. kid. Yeah. So it's, it, just like we spoke earlier, also on the, on the last panel was, yes, many times it's the student, but many times it's also the teacher. Right. And that's why it has to be uh, that wow. partnership, and how do we really make that those that relationship? Yeah. Yeah. So. Yes. Comment and a question. I found it interesting that you. You have all these techniques you describe for improving learning and teaching, but you didn't start with where we're going to create all these you know, approaches to improve teaching and learning. You started with trying to solve a problem and overcome a barrier, which was test anxiety. And so, in other words, you didn't you didn't approach the problem directly. That is, you approached the problem that you identified directly, but you didn't you seek to improve teaching and learning. You seek to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. so is that accurate? Yes. Okay. And then the question is, you started to allude to it. Um, well, I guess it's a two-part question. It's both these directions. One is, how do you have data to the effects of retention in your classes? 